Okay. So we've been exploring a thesis we call the dependence thesis, which says that the capacity for self-awareness depends on the capacity for specific forms of social interaction with others. Interactions loosely labeled second personal. If our arguments, or if arguments in general for the dependence thesis is successful, it'll indicate ways in which our indebtedness to others runs very deep. We're dependent on others not only for ways of thinking and knowing about our social and natural environments, but even for ways of thinking and knowing about ourselves. Correlatively, intellectual humanity, conceived of as recognition of our dependence on others, should be extended to these areas as well, areas about which many philosophers hold, still hold, that we are self-sufficient in roughly the way Descartes thought we are. Now, in pursuing these ideas, we've worked on two fronts, so to speak. We've worked collaboratively um, on trying to get clear about appeals to the second person in testimony, in moral knowledge, and philosophy of mind. But we've also pursued individual projects. Um, Guy has been working on the relation, relation <coughs> on the importance of being known by others for the pursuit of self-knowledge. Johannes has been working about on the relation between expressing and knowing one's belief. And I've work, been working on joint attention and the second person. And we thought that rather than try and sketch a general story here about the dependence thesis, we'd give a 10 minute summary, each of us, of the work we've been doing. So presentation of the questions we've been concerned with and the claims we've been trying to develop and articulate. So headlines of three separate papers, 10 minutes each, and I'm beginning with mine. <coughs> So as the title of the paper I've been working on, Joint Attention and the Second Person, suggests, the issues I've been concerned with lie at the inter um, intersection of two very disputed areas and topics. One is, what is the phenomenon of joint attention and how we should explain it? And secondly, is there such a thing as distinctively sui generis second person awareness that doesn't collapse? into a combination of third-person ways of thinking of somebody else and first-person ways of thinking about myself. So what I want to do is start with joint attention, present a puzzle about it, and suggest the way appeal to the second person could help dissolve that puzzle. <coughs> to get going, I want to have a brief example, everyday example of joint attention for people who are aren't that familiar with the phenomenon. So suppose you're in your office talking to a colleague and a fire alarm goes off for the nth time of the day. You and your colleague exchange glances, pull a face, get up and troop down with the rest of them. Now there's a great deal that can happen when you exchange looks. Perhaps one of you expresses a half thought of sitting it out, a glimmer of rebellion, Perhaps you immediately exchange looks of dutiful obedience, and so forth. But underlying all of these, as it were, commentaries, the, and the basis for them, there's a mutual recognition of a shared experience, the bell going off. When your eyes meet, you establish you've both heard the bell. When that happens, you, your colleague, and the bell form what's called a joint attention triangle. That's my visual aid, the joint attention <laughs> triangle. This is the bell, the object. This is you, and this is your colleague. Okay, That's the triangle, which provides the basis for, in this case, nonverbal commentary, but it could also be, say, a labor or something like that or just say, the bell's loud. Now, most developmental psychologists treat the emergence of the capacity to engage in such a triadic relation at about 10 months as a landmark of sorts. 
the relation is thought of as importantly different from the earlier dyadic relations infants enter into, either with physical objects, through seeing them, or acting on them, or with their caregivers through mainly, but not exclusively, emotional exchanges. But once we ask how exactly we should describe this triangle, and why it's important, and in what sense it's a landmark, all hell breaks loose. There's hardly a debate in philosophy and in developmental psychology and more recently in philosophy that hasn't ridden on to this triangle and so forth. Now, one of the questions concerns issues about why it's a landmark, both in the sense of the capacities it draws on, but also what it enables. What is it that you can do? Or what is it that a child can do that she couldn't do before joint attention set in? And I'll say a few words about that in connection to the dependence thesis and also to humility towards the end. Another huge debate, at least one that's occupied philosophers who've engaged with it, is about whether it's right or not to adopt a so-called rich interpretation of the phenomenon. On the rich interpretation, you and the infant are mutually aware of your perception of the same object. The expression sometimes is it's mutually manifest to you both, or all is out in the open. Now, I just want to assume that rich interpretation. I think it's the interpretation that Bruner assumed, and one of the reasons he thought it was a landmark and why it enabled language learning and so forth, but I'm just going to assume it here. What I'm interested in is, suppose that's the correct interpretation, how should we explain the relation between the adult and the infant, or you and your colleague, when your eyes lock, or when a mutual attention is established? So I'm interested in this here. Okay. Now, in philosophy, and this is now I come to the dilemma, as it were, there's very roughly, you can distinguish between two kinds of account. One appeals to quite complex iterations to explain the kind of awareness in play, which is meant to hold both for the one-year-old and the caregiver and for what happens when you hear the bell together. The other posits a primitive, unexplained relation of experience. I'll say a few words about each of these. And in a sense, the puzzle is more important than why I think the second person solved it. So on one view developed recently by Chris Peacock, and I'll go back to the adult case, when, I, when our eyes lock, when you and your colleague's eyes lock, this is true of each of you. Each of you thinks she's aware of me as a self-conscious subject. And the account he develops, that means I have to ascribe to that person the capacity to refer to a first-person concept and ascribe it to me as a user. And on the account he develops, that requires three levels of embedding of the first-person concept when I entertain this thought about the person who is co-attending with me. Reacting against this kind of complexity as highly implausible, whether it's a child, but also when you and your colleague exchange looks. We find an account which I've extracted from John Campbell's account of what, how we explain mutual awareness. And on his account, we have to treat presence as co-attender, as a primitive experiential relation. Okay? So you, on this story, of each of you it's true, you're acquainted with an object and and thereby presented with it, presented with the other person and acquainted with it. But the difference between your acquaintance with the object and your acquaintance with your co-attender is that somehow the other is presented as a co-attender. But the insistence is you can't say anything more about it because as soon as you try to decompose it, you get back to implausible iterations. So that's the puzzle an unexplained primitive relation, okay, you 
So suppose this is you, and that's your colleague. Here's what's true of you. You're acquainted with the object. The object is present to you. You're acquainted, presented with this subject, but a special kind of presentation. And there's nothing more to say of it. And the experience is a three-place experiential relation. Now, I actually think that there's something right about Campbell's resistance to iterations here. Whether it's the young child or what's happening with us when we constantly co-attend to things. But I do think we need to say more about it. It's not the primitive in the sense that there is nothing more to explain about it. Even though I'm very sympathetic to Campbell's idea that we should treat the relation here between you and the object as constitutive of a certain kind of experience where you can't give, analyze that experience away by appeal to iterations that happen in each co-attender's mind independently of the existence of the other. And this is where I think appeal to the joint, uh, to the second person can help. How am I doing my minute-wise? Uh, I'm already on 10. OK. I'll have two more minutes. Appeal to the second person has had a big press recently and has built into subjectivity and there being some radical paradigm shift when you talk about interactions as opposed to theorizing. In my view, the challenge, though, with all these appeals is to say, what's different, a second person awareness, that can't be accounted for by appeal to something like Peacock's story. This person I perceive is the person who is aware of me, and then you bring in your first person concepts. So to say there is something sui generis here is to say that when you stand in a second person relation, a relation which makes possible addressing the other person using the second person, you are aware of that person in a way that you wouldn't be unless you stood in that communicative relation which enables address using the second person. And that's quite a radical claim. And so conditions of communicability enter into the individuation of a form of awareness. So that's one claim I think you have to accept. Otherwise, it just dissolves. There's nothing there. She thinks I, she's aware of me and so forth. Now, in my view, that's one claim we have to make here. The second, I think we have to appeal to the idea that when I stand in this kind of relation, which makes possible the address of the, to the other person, there's a kind of mutual acquaintance that we have with each other. So I'm presented to that, or let's start from my perspective. She, this person, you, are presented to me in a way that depends on my being presented to you in exactly the same way. So it's a kind of mutual acquaintance, the idea is, that's made possible by the adoption of a communicative stance. And the adoption of a communicative stance is something that we experience. We can tell when somebody's ready to engage. And I think this is part of Bruner when he talked about joint attention. So it is slotting essentially into this kind of communicative relation. I'll stop here and won't say how this bears on humility. Okay, so as Naomi pointed out, I've been thinking about self-knowledge, and in particular, thinking about the idea that some of our self-knowledge might be dependent on the knowledge that other people have of us and our capacity to acquire knowledge from other people. Um, and I've been thinking about that in general, but one of the things I've been focusing on most uh, for purposes of this project have been what I think of as kinds of structural limits on the extent to which that's going to be possible. So I just want to say something brief about that uh, now. So I think there are three very natural thoughts that make plausible the idea that we might be able to acquire knowledge about ourselves of a distinctively 
uh, self-knowledge kind um, make it plausible to think that that might be possible. So the first is just that it seems plausible to us now that there are various ways in which we can be ignorant about ourselves. We can lack bits of self-knowledge about ourselves. Um, we can fail to realize what we really believe on some matter. We can fail to understand what will make us truly happy, uh, what we really desire, even in specific cases. So it looks as though we all now accept that it's possible for us to be ignorant in various ways about our own minds, and about our own selves. The second uh, plausible thought is that it's possible for other people to know plenty of things about our minds, right? Few people these days are entirely skeptical uh, about the possibility of knowing other minds. So we think, I can be ignorant about myself, and moreover, you can know about me. So you can have various bits of knowledge about, about me and my mind. And third, a third plausible idea in this area is that it's possible where someone else knows something for them to tell you that thing. And insofar as it's reasonable for you to accept what they tell you, it's possible for you thereby to acquire knowledge from them. Right? So you're ignorant about some fact about yourself, your interlocutor knows some fact about you, and they're able to transmit that knowledge to you via testimony. So if you put those ideas together, it becomes enormously plausible, I think, that it ought to be possible for one to acquire self-knowledge from other people via a testimonial route if not by our, other, by our other kinds of routes. But on reflection, things are slightly less straightforward. So for that to work out, it has to be the case not only that I can be ignorant about myself and that you can know about me, but that those can be possible uh, in conjunction. So that my ignorance about myself doesn't make it difficult or impossible for you to know about me. Okay, and one, one kind of case we might worry about here would be the extent to which you rely in knowing about me on what I say. Okay, so first order expressions, I say it's warm here. Second order expressions, I think it's warm here. And those are kinds of bits of evidence that might well be crucial to your capacity to know my mind. And insofar as they are, we might think that my uh, ignorance, depending on how extreme it is, will cause difficulties, will make me opaque to you in a way that I'm normally not opaque. Um, the second kind of structural issue I've been worrying about is uh, the extent to which my capacity to acquire knowledge from other people through their testimony might also depend on my knowing things about myself. In particular, my uh, knowledge about my own reliability and keeping track of who uh, viable interlocutors are what kinds of people and in what kinds of circumstances uh, I'm liable to be uh, able to acquire knowledge from. There's a third kind of issue which I haven't explored in detail but which I intend to explore in future work which is an old trope uh, uh, that arose as early as kind of Freud's, uh, almost Freud's er earliest work on these kinds of topics which is that um, there's something very special about the role of self-knowledge in psychic health um, and one of the reflexes of that is that there's a problem in thinking about, say, therapeutic situations and thinking about what happens when someone tells you something about yourself, knowledge of which would in some sense amount to a case of self-knowledge, which is that, um, in particular in therapeutic situations, this doesn't seem to help. So your therapist figuring out that you're uh, you feel you've been betrayed by your mother or what have you. They figure that out about you, it's not good enough for them simply to tell you that, even if you go so far as to trust them and accept what they tell you. That doesn't cure all your ills. And this led Freud to say some, some quite weird things, like um, not all knowledge is knowledge, right? So the thought was that there's something special about self-knowledge that we need to capture and that makes uh, self-knowledge proper uh, the kind of thing that it would be difficult to acquire through testimony. So that's, that's a third kind of structural issue that, that one would want to explore. But let me say something a, a little tiny bit more about the um, other two structural issues. So just as a kind of intuition pump um, about the role of, of someone's self-knowledge in, in their capacity to be transparent to you, you might think about a case, kind of standard source of case in the literature on self-ignorance, of someone who on the one hand seems to manifest 
um, some problematic belief, right? So perhaps they manifest the belief that women are, are less good at academic subjects than men, something like that. Right? So you look at the way they assess candidates for jobs or what have you, and it turns out that you know, there's, there's some kind of clear statistical bias in the way that they rank people. Um, but you ask them, and they sincerely tell you that they don't think that at all. They never give, it, give expression to, to even first order views to that effect. And now you have conflicting appearances being presented by this individual. On the one hand, you have some evidence that there's some kind of inclination built into their functioning. And on the other hand, you have their maybe clear denials that they're in any way biased. And the difficulty here isn't that, I mean, we can get that evidence and that can be fine. We can know this person has certain inclinations and certain behavioral propensities. The question is what we can figure out on that basis with respect to this person's mind, right? So what they believe about the circumstance. And I think that in certain kinds of situation of this sort, that can be very difficult to establish. It might well be uh, that in some cases we face genuine indeterminacy. In other cases, it's just very, very difficult. And perhaps in certain cases, impossible to distribute the evidence in such a way that one figures out exactly what's going on in this person's mind depending on the extremity of the, the ignorance and the patterning of first order and second order behaviors. Um, so that's the kind of case where I think one can start to get a sense of structural limitations on uh, the ability of other people to know us in cases of extreme ignorance. And that imposes some limits on the extent to which we can be in a position to fix up our ignorance by relying on other people. I think the path back to full psychic health is going to be less straightforward than that, as Freud in effect suggested. Um, I'm going to stop there. I could say more about some of the other cases, but I think I've said enough to give you a flavour of what I've been up to. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to continue um, on themes um, guys, Guy was talking about. Um, my <coughs> work has been um, basically on the phenomenon that in the philosoph philosophical literature is known as first-person authority. Um, okay, so the um, basic scene that sets the, the issues for work on first-person authority is very roughly this. So we've got someone, let's call him A, asking someone else, uh, let's call her uh, B, what do you believe about the question whether P? And B replies, I believe that P. Okay, so this is an entirely unremarkable thing that happens more or less all the time. And the question people working on first-person authority are interested in is, suppose um, A comes to know that B believes that P in this way. This, again, seems to be pretty humdrum and uh, unremarkable. How should we explain um, A's knowledge of B's belief. So what's, what's the, exactly what's the way, how should we describe and articulate the way in which um, A comes to know about B's belief in this way? And here there, there are two um, issues I want to raise about um, this in particular, um, which are not, normally not distinguished. I think there are two, two issues which are normally kind of run together, which are uh, worth distinguishing. The first is the question of, I call the question of epistemic dependence. Does the possibility of A, um, acquiring knowledge, sorry, I seem to have switched to A and S here. Uh, a, acquiring knowledge of S belief in the way he does, depend on S herself knowing that she believes that P. So the question here is, does a proper explanation of A's knowledge of S's mind turn on an explanation of S's self-knowledge of her own mind? Is self-knowledge essential to an explanation of um, knowledge of other minds in this kind of case? Um, that's the question of epistemic dependence. Um, the other question is a more specific question, the testimony question, as I call it. Uh, here is how, um, how I, I, I articulate it. Is A's knowledge an example of testimonial knowledge in the following specific sense? S is telling A something S knows and to which S has a kind of access A lacks. 
A believes S, and in that way, S's knowledge, though of course not her mode of access, becomes available to, to A. So a testimonial, uh, a testimonial model, a, a positive answer to that question would be a testimonial model, or in, in a kind of specific sense of a sort of eyewitness model. It's like Vasu telling me that there is a hummingbird outside because she has a special, special access to that because she saw it, um, and I, believing her in that way, come to know that there is a hummingbird. Except that in this case, um, people who answer the testimony question in the affirmative, of course, think um, that the AS's first person access to her own beliefs is not just contingently, but necessarily unavailable to A. So S has a kind of special first person access to her own beliefs. Uh, she knows about her own beliefs in a way that is only av um, available to her. OK, so usually. Um, the assumption is that um, you have to accept answers to these questions as a package. So what's known as an epistemic approach to first-person authority um, returns an affirmative answer to both questions. Um, on the other hand, non-epistemic theorists answer both questions in the negative. Okay, so the project of my paper has been to argue that there is a, an alternative way to think about this, which is to break the terms of the alignment here to say yes to the question of epistemic dependence. Indeed, S's self-knowledge is of the essence for understanding A's knowledge of S's mind. But it's, it's, it's a mistake to think of this along the lines of a testimonial or eyewitness model where uh, each of us has a special kind of access to their own minds. So very, very briefly, and um, this is just a, a sketch of the main ideas, there are two elements to this alternative view. Um, one is what I call a double aspect view of the expressive role of self-descriptions of belief. Um, so on this view, S and P can, perf can simultaneously, um, simultaneously perform two functions. It simultaneously serves as a way of telling A that she, namely S, believes that P, but it's also actually an expression of the very belief she ostensibly self-describes. So there is, in the literature on this, a kind of sort of Homeric uh, battle between two views. One is that when you say, I believe that P, you're just describing your state of mind. You're self-ascribing a certain non-factive state of mind. And the opposite view is, well, actually, no, you're not in a detached sort of way describing your state of mind. You're articulating, you're expressing, you're venting your, your attitude. And uh, I want to suggest that we can actually accept both of those views, because it's entirely common for statements to serve more than one expressive function. So that's one element. And the other element is um, what I call a modest epistemology for self-knowledge, which is basically the idea um, that we typically know our, belie our beliefs in expressing them. OK, so that's the, the basic uh, um, claim. And I'm just going to say a little bit more about the second element and then sketch how it might all come together. Um, so one concern, one interesting um, issue, I think, that we need to get right in understanding self-knowledge and first-person authority is um, the nature of sincerity. Um, here is one view of sincerity which ought to have been uh, also have come with a view of Rousseau because it's um, with a picture of Rousseau because it's Rousseau's view. So you have to imagine the, the man with a felt hat. Um, and this is Williams' um, formulation of the Rousseau view of sincerity. Um, we first and immediately have a transparent self understanding and then go on either to give other people a, a sincere revelation of our belief or else dissimulate in a way that will mislead them. Okay, so on the Rousseau view, self knowledge and the exercise of sincerity are two entirely separate matters. You first come to have transparent self-understanding, so self-knowledge based on first-person access. And then you may, or indeed may not, tell others what, uh, what's, in, what's on your mind or in your mind. Um, and Williams rejects that view. And um, imagine, I don't know if you've seen the fantastic uh, photo of Bernard Williams where he kind of laughs at you in a broad, uh, kind of broad grin. So that was supposed to be there. So Williams's view is that sincerity at the most basic level is simply openness, a lack of inhibition, where this is the disposition spontaneously to come out with what we believe. And he says that in the simplest case, I'm confronted with my belief as what I would spontaneously assert. So here, it's the exercise of, sin of sincerity 
that plays an essential role in explaining self-knowledge. It's not that first you have an explanation of self-knowledge and then you may or may not exercise uh, sincerity. It's actually by exercising sincerity, namely in this basic sense of openness, the disposition spontaneously to come out with what you believe, that you get to know about your mind in the first place. Um, okay, so then um, one phase in the project is to try and understand what Williams means by, or ought to mean by, since, by spontaneity. So well, how should we think about spontaneity if, in this sense, um, if we are to give spontaneity an interesting role in explaining self-knowledge? Um, so here I'm going to be very quick. So the suggestion is that, um, and this is now me, not Williams, because Williams doesn't really say very much about what spontaneity is supposed to be. Um, many assertions, whether in outer or indeed inner speech, are spontaneous in the following sense. They are not premeditated as to what um, Williams' formulation, i.e. not pre premeditated as to what the answer is. You may have premeditated that you want to answer a certain question, but you, have, you may not have premeditated as to what you actually want to say about that question. What you want to say is something you come out with spontaneously. Um, it's also not rationally based on prior knowledge of the belief that they express. Following Hornsby, we might think of this um, on the lines of voicing our thoughts is something we're able to simply do. It's a kind of basic action. It's not um, rationalized in terms of some instrumental belief. Yet, I want to say it's something that we do intentionally. And therefore, um, the following account becomes available or becomes a possibility. We typically know our beliefs in spontaneously, spontaneously uh, expressing them because um, expressing them is something we do intentionally and we, we usually are aware of what we're intentionally doing. We have we, what Antikam uh, labeled um, knowledge in intention of what we're doing insofar as we are acting intentionally. Okay, um, right. So here is the traditional epistemic approach to first-person authority. We have first-person access that makes self-knowledge possible, explains self-knowledge. Self-knowledge in turn makes knowledge of other minds possible through testimony. This is what I call the eyewitness model. Um, on the mo kind of model I've been trying to develop, um, which I call the joint self-knowledge model, um, there is a common explanation, a common factor that underpins both self-knowledge and knowledge of other minds, and that's expression, the capacity to express one's beliefs. Um, the notable thing about this um, second diagram, is, of course, is that other knowledge seems to be overdetermined. There are two arrows leading to other knowledge. So others are able to know about um, someone's beliefs, both because in saying, I believe that P, they're expressing their belief, and because in saying I believe that P, they're telling others about what they believe. And the suggestion is that these are actually not, I mean, the overdetermination here is not a problem because the two roots to other knowledge are actually intelligently connected. So there is a sense in which we can actually share, others can share the way in which we come to know about our own minds insofar as we do, do so through spontaneously expressing our attitudes. Okay, thank you. That's a very nice question. I wish I'd thought about it more, or rather, I wish I'd come to more kind of uh, clearer results. So intention seems to be a good, a relatively similar case. Um, what's perhaps not so clear is the case of emotions, which in a way is kind of the interesting case. Um, and I suspect this is a, an important element, of a, or this might potentially be an important element of an account of how we know our emotions, but it's certainly not going to be a complete story because the emotion case is just much more complicated and much more interesting in some ways because, because there is a range of sources that, which are relevant. And also, you, we don't kind of identify with our current emotions necessarily in the way in which we typically identify with our current beliefs. So I think that's, a, that's quite a different case, where the intention, I think, is, is probably um, a closer, closer relation. 
uh, for Johannes. Uh, Thank you. So in the speech act literature, uh, expressing is often used in a way where telling is just a species of expressing. Uh, so in that literature, when you express your, say, providing evidence to your audience that you have a certain mental state, whether you've got it or not, so there's also a further sincerity condition on expressing. Then others will use the word expressing in a factive sense, and they'll say, no, you can only express things that you've got. So you're just pressing something out. So it feels like you're using it in the latter sense, and that makes possible a kind of discovery model. You can find out things yeah. about yourself yeah. by intentionally pressing them out. Yeah. But at the same time, you can deceive yourself. That is, you can have attitudes you don't really have, and press, or you know, you can think you believe something when in fact you really don't, and you can press out the attitude which is the, the thinking you believe something when in fact you really don't. And there's also the phenomenon of thinking out loud where you're kind of discovering, say, what you believe by pressing out a variety of thoughts that you're having. So is that all sort of consistent within the model that you can, you know, press things out that you don't really have? Uh, and the, not in the sense that you intend to deceive somebody else, uh, but you're sort of failing to learn about yourself in, in expressing attitudes. Yes, I think it is. Um, so one thing I wasn't talking about is the limitations of uh, first-person authority, which I'm, I'm very interested in. And it seems to me giving a central role to sincerity in explaining self-knowledge um, is attractive precisely because it might also help to explain limitations of self-knowledge and indeed um, might help to explain misconceptions we might have and we often do have about our beliefs. So yes, I, I am using expressing in a sort of factive sense. So that leaves open um, the possibility that you might think you're expressing your belief on something, but you're wrong. In, in actual fact, you might be, uh, it might be as if you are expressing your belief on something, but in actual fact, you're just um, uh, <coughs> self-ascribing an attitude perhaps you wish you had, or uh, for some other reason are just mistaken about. So I, I, I think there are some straightforward case, cases where you're straightforwardly wrong about uh, what you believe, and i.e. where you're not exercising sincerity, which I think might actually help to explain. So your failure to exercise sincerity, you're kind of dis, uh, being disabled from, from exercising um, uh, sincerity through certain kind of motivational factors and so on, might uh, help to explain why your epistemic position is, is the way it is in the end. Um, so I've got a, a question, a clarification that may be something else. If you can go back maybe a slide or two where you yep. come to, to know your beliefs in spontaneous, yeah, so uh, now I'll ask okay. for the in spontaneously expressed. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say a bit more what you mean by the in expressing them? Is it, is yeah. it a necessary condition, a sufficient condition, both? So uh, what I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, get the necessary so what so I meant was yeah so is my expressing a belief necessary for my knowing my belief or is my expressing a belief sufficient for my knowing a belief or okay I, I didn't want to make a completely general claim about this being the only way we ever come to know about what we believe so I'm, I'm minded to be pluralist about okay. these sorts of things it seems to me this is one very significant and okay. central so way in which we get to know yeah, okay. that's right. Uh, the, the, the point of the in is kind of there's an implicit contrast with on the basis of. Okay. It's not the case that your expression provides you with any kind of epistemic basis on, on which you get to believe, I believe, that P. Um, the thought is that in expressing them, insofar as you're doing so intentionally, in this very basic sense okay. of intentional, you typically know what you're doing. Okay, yeah, that's helpful because I was uh, worried about uh, individuals that have difficulty expressing their beliefs. And if yes. there's a sufficiency claim, yes. or sorry, a, a necessity claim, then it would look like they couldn't have self knowledge in the relevant sense. I mean, th that's, that, that so, sounds okay. very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I'm also pretty kind of liberal on what counts as expressing it. Uh, I, I, it seems to me inner speech can be a way of expressing one's belief. Now, that may sound a bit odd to, to, to some, okay. but uh, in a broad sense, it seems to me an, an act of inner speech can be an expression. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, so this is just a weird thought I had or insight I had. So it seems to me, because I'm a psychotherapist, is that people really don't like self-knowledge that is related to them by a therapist. In fact, most therapists go out of their way not to <laughs> direct interpretations because they know people resist it. 
they really don't like that kind of self-knowledge. And yet, on the other hand, people, when they fill out these like little quizzes and magazines or psychological tests, and, and they get feedback on that, they totally embrace it as, oh yes, that's me. And is that because when they're doing those tests, that's a form of expression? Whereas when the therapist is giving them an interpretation about this is I think, the way you are, they don't see that as coming from anything they've expressed. I mean, I, I just, it does seem to me that there's that, always this yes. weird disconnect. Like, why do they believe this magazine article, you know, this thing in Cosmopolitan, <laughs> but they don't believe the person who's been listening to them for like six months? Um, and. That's a really maybe interesting they're, question maybe because, expressing their because in, indirectly? in a way, both cases are uh, cases where the knowledge you get is, in some say, it sends kind of theoretical. I mean, in, in one, in, in the case of the therapist, it's the therapist's theorizing about you, making coming up with some kind of explanation of what might be going on, and and it's, it kind of makes sense that people don't particularly like that because it gives others. This connects with some people. Something Sky said it gives others a certain authority on what's yeah, going on yeah, yeah. At, at a very deep level with themselves, and that's a bit uncomfortable. But the funny thing is, that, I mean, in really, the same should be true about the questionnaire, because it's also, I mean, it's, it's not really an, a matter of expressing a state. Is it, perhaps I'm not too familiar with the way it works, but... You don't recall one? You don't. It's a psychological where you endorse certain beliefs. Yes, but then it, it kind of adds up, and then, then you kind of do calculate the... And you're adding them all up, and then somebody yes. says, oh, so on the basis of this, you're this kind of person, and then, but, oh, yes, yeah, oh, but you don't really, yeah. I mean, perhaps you have more more liberty. You, you're at more liberty to to ignore. If you don't like the result, you can just I don't know. Um, I don't know how, how that works. It also makes a difference that the outcome there is playing about say character or what kind of person you are, whereas it's expressing more that's very much about specific beliefs you have. So you're not going to necessarily find out your brain. But it, it may be that, that well, because the process in the, in the questionnaire case is a kind of autonomous thing. They, people work it out for themselves, whereas in the, in the um, psychoanalysis uh, case, it, it yeah, absolutely, yeah, yes, it's yes. But it's a kind of, oh, yeah, that's, so yes, so that's what I meant. Yes. It's not just traits, but, oh, you're somebody who believes that, you know, everything should be this way. I mean, they have a very different view of the world. 